This program has been made possible by generous gifts from our friends of Cross the Bridge. Thank you for your support. Just failure is not an option. When we went to school, they taught us about different things, but they didn't teach us some of the really some of the more important things. They didn't teach us about God, unless you went to a Christian school. Didn't teach us about the love of God, the forgiveness of God, how to tithe, how to serve, how to be born again, about this spiritual battle. Now, these are things that we learn in studying the Bible. These are things that we learn in doing the Bible. And that's why what we do here at the bridge is so unique and so important, teaching the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. A hundred years ago, that was not that unique. Martin Luther, I don't know if you're aware of this, Martin Luther, who was an important person during the Reformation, he left town because of the pressures, and he was going verse by verse through a book, left town. He was gone for three years. He came back and started with the verse he left off on. It's what we do here. That's an important thing, and it's a unique thing, sadly, but that equips you for the battle. It equips you to be able to enjoy life, to have life abundantly, and also able to present life abundantly to other people. Amen? Now, in this battle, one of the things that happens, and we tend to think in terms of the battle being outside and around us, and it is. Sometimes, but it's also inside of us. As much as we like to pretend that we never struggle and there's never an internal battle, I've been walking with the Lord long enough, I've been pastoring long enough to know that every person in here is struggling in one area or another. Especially those back there. No, I'm kidding. All of us. And of course, the enemy doesn't want us to share that because if we share it with somebody and we can receive prayer and encouragement, we might overcome in that area. I'm not saying stand up in the middle of the church and tell everybody what you're presently struggling with. There's not wisdom in doing that. But you know the first thing, the first struggle... And I've seen it over and over in my life and other people's lives. And sitting down with somebody and saying, hey, brother, hey, sister, I, I noticed that this is going on and this might be an issue that you need to direct some attention to prayers about word study. And that is when we're faced with something that we've done or said wrong. Now, the first thing that happens when somebody tells you, shares with you something you've done wrong is a very interesting dynamic. I'm really fascinated by it. I know that's kind of weird, but the, the first thing you're tempted to think is that the person sitting in front of you sharing this with you is your enemy or doesn't like you. Why don't you like me, man? I thought we were friends. You go tell me I did something wrong. The exact opposite is true. When you have somebody that comes to you willing to share with you that you've messed up, that there's an issue in your life, you know what? You probably just found yourself a friend. 
Now, I'm not talking about a person that gets up in your face and raises their voice and takes great glee in pointing out what's wrong with you. There's a difference. But somebody speaking the truth in love, you found a friend. Because it would have been far easier for them not to say anything. Nobody likes to talk about, that's not true. I was going to say nobody likes to talk about what's wrong with somebody else, but some people really enjoy talking about what's wrong with somebody else. But I mean, when, you're, when they're in the room. And so, the first thing is thinking, well, this person is not my friend. And yet, what's one of the great sources of figuring out when we're wrong and how we're wrong? Word of God. Is the word of God your enemy? No, it's your friend. Now, some people treat this like it's their enemy because they don't want to listen to it. They don't want to apply it to their lives. But this word speaks to our lives, where we are right now and where we're called to be going. And then the defense mechanisms kick up. And we all have them. And they're very similar. There's really three, three main things. And if you're taking notes, jot these down. And you know what? If you're not taking notes, jot these down. Because these are going to, in relationships, you're going to see this over and over. And this will help you have a discussion that doesn't lead into an argument if you listen to what I say. Why? Because I've had, I've had far too many arguments in my life, and I've learned from some of them. The first thing that you want to do when you've realized you are wrong, we're wrong, or somebody's pointing it out, or the Bible's pointing it out, or a pastor's speaking to it, the first thing you think is why it's not your fault. It's one of the first things that pops up. That's part of the danger sometimes in psychoanalysis is there's a basis of, of they're going to talk to you to figure out what went wrong in your past that caused you to be the way you are now where you make mistakes. Let me save you a whole lot of time, energy, and money in the counseling industry. You were born a sinner. That's what's wrong with you. That's what's wrong with me. But we begin, oh, it's, it's not my fault. It's, I, I, I have, um, I, I wasn't nursed long enough, so I have separation anxiety. That's why I rob banks. <laughs> it's crazy some of the stuff people come up with. No, when you do something, you are accountable for that action. Because truly, you know, it's only in rare instances that somebody can really violate your free will. You do that, and you have to be accountable for it. And if you're arguing, and here's the thing, it's so important, gang, while you're arguing if it's your fault or not, you can't receive forgiveness. You can argue about why it's not your fault, or you can receive forgiveness. But if you're arguing why it's not your fault, yeah, it's not my fault. It's really not my fault. It's because my mother did this. My father did that. My grandparents were like this. My kids are like that. So, you know. You're not going to ask forgiveness. It's not your fault. Or you can simply say, yeah, I did that. Yeah, I said that. And while my mom and dad weren't perfect and my kids aren't perfect and my grandparents aren't perfect and my church isn't perfect, though my pastor's close, Sorry, couldn't help it. I did something wrong, and I'm sorry, God. And you know what's awesome is that takes just a few seconds, and it's done with. This can go on for years. Well, I know I did that, but you shouldn't have said that. Well, I know I said that, but you shouldn't have done that. Another thing we do is we start to tell why it's okay. 
that we did that. Why in that particular situation, that sin was okay and acceptable, even though the Bible condemns it. But in our situation, we are the exception to the scripture and it's okay that we did it. You know, well, the Bible may say it's wrong, but I'm kind of the exception to that reasoning. And then the third thing, and it's a very familiar one, what is wrong with the person correcting you? <laughs> Pastors get this all the time. Because we're up here talking about Jesus. We're talking about perfection. And we'll talk about one thing and, oh, but who are you to be saying that? Or your spouse. And the way this looks is you usually fire right back something that they have done wrong, either presently or in the past. Somebody says, you know what, you, you just spoke harshly to me and hurt my feelings. Oh yeah, well you spoke harshly to me yesterday. Well, what does that really have to do with the first thing? It's just kind of a smoke screen. And we kind of have a, a rule in our house that once the first correction goes forth, that's the only correction that's spoken of. Because this back and forth stuff can go on for days. And it doesn't get anybody in anywhere. Because it just gets into this finger pointing stuff. And the argument escalates and the emotions get hotter and words fly that are hurtful. We read about it online, watch it on television, and hear about it on the radio. Our world is filled with violence and fear. Whether it's threats of terrorism around the world or senseless violence in our own backyard, our world is clearly broken and in need of hope. That's why this month only, Cross the Bridge Ministries is offering Know Your Future, Be Immune to Terrorism. This special presentation from David McGee was filmed on the anniversary of 9-11 and is a message of hope and victory. This insightful teaching also exposes the truth about Islam's dangerous past while rejoicing in God's plan for our future. Join David McGee as he helps you and your loved ones to walk in peace and not be afraid of what the future holds. The product Know Your Future, Be Immune to Terrorism is our gift to you for a donation of any amount to Cross the Bridge Ministries. Call today to receive your copy of Know Your Future by dialing 877-458-5508 or visit us online at crossthebridge.com. It's kind of the shoot the messenger syndrome, if you will. And here's the problem with that. When somebody comes to you, and I found out a long time ago, actually as a professional musician, I noticed something. That the person that was coming to you with a problem was usually your friend. The person that came to you patting you on the back going, oh, you're great, you're doing great, everything's fine, it's perfect, we so appreciate you, everything's lovely. Not necessarily your friend. The guy that comes up and says, hey, I'm gonna, out, I'm gonna go out on a limb here, but Maybe you shouldn't drink a fifth of liquor before you play guitar. This is a story somebody told me. See, the other person patting you on the back is probably calling the union for your replacement. They will not invest in you personally. See, because when you say to somebody, hey, you may need to work on this or this may be an issue. Somebody's investing in you personally. They're wanting you to win the battle. And if we're going to point out the faults of somebody who's pointing out what's going on in our lives, the problem with that is there's nobody's perfect. The person that God is going to use to bring an issue to you is not perfect. So all you have to really do is perfect the ability to deflect back on that person and what's wrong with them 
And you don't have to grow as a Christian your entire life. Because there's always going to be something wrong with them. But instead of pointing out what's wrong with them, realize you just got an opportunity to grow. And if God's bringing it to you, he's going to give you the strength and the grace to get past this and to grow through it. And you can be victorious in this struggle and grow. See, this is a, I just described something that we all do on a regular basis that the Bible really wants to help us with. And, And listen, if you're sitting there going, wow, how does he, how did he know I do that? We all do that. Now, and if you're sitting there going, well, I never do that. (sighs) Lord, help that liar. (laughs) We all do that. All. That includes you. You may be better at it. And by better, I mean better at hiding it. We've, all, we've been doing this for a long time. Since the first original sin, we've been doing this, trying to blame other people. God said to Adam, don't eat from the fruit of this tree. Okay. Now, keep in mind, I don't... I've heard teachings about how Eve was so bad and so evil. You know what? At least Eve had to be talked into it. Guys, this is going to hurt for just a second. There's this discussion between Eve and the enemy. And like I said last week, don't be talking to the devil. But it, she, had, she was coerced into it. Do you know what happened with Adam? What you eating, Eve? It's food. Oh! <laughs> and then God said, Adam, what did you do? And, of course, Adam said, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I ate what you told me not to eat, and it's all my fault. And I should have been protecting that woman. I, I was gone when she was talking to the, the serpent. That's not what he said. Genesis 3.12, then the man said, that woman you gave me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. Now, look at his, he said, okay, you gave me this woman who gave me this fruit. I just ate it. I am a victim of circumstance here. We've been doing that ever since. If only my wife. Mm-mm-mm. But blaming, you know, blaming God, blaming your wife, blaming Eve, blaming anybody but yourself is not going to gain forgiveness. You have to accept responsibility before you can ask forgiveness. That's the way Christianity works. I can't stand up here and go, you know, Lord Carson, he did something really silly this week. I need you to forgive him for that. That's not the way it works. I have to go to God for my sins and my forgiveness. And if I'm sitting there arguing with him on whether I messed up or not, I can't get to the forgiveness part. I can't get to the good stuff. I'm still wallowing around in the bad stuff, the sin and the guilt and the shame, and clinging to that because the human pride doesn't want to admit that it's wrong. And that's part of the battle. Blame it on Eve. We blame it on Adam. Adam is the one mentioned in Scripture in the New Testament. Romans 5, 14 says, Still, everyone died from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not disobey an explicit command of God as Adam did. doesn't mention Eve. I believe that Adam was supposed to be looking after Eve when she was talking with the enemy. And so he lays at his feet. Now Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who was yet to come. So we have these things, these areas 
And primarily it's in the mind, but you could break it down into from the mind, mind, speech, body. Mind, speech, body. But the mind's at the top because the mind controls the speech. Some of our minds are too quickly connected to our mouths. We need to pause. One thing the Lord's taught me over the years when somebody asks me a question is to pause before I answer and think about it. It bothers some people when they ask me a question and there's seconds that just linger until I answer, but I've avoided some serious mistakes that way. And your mind controls your body. Your mind can control what your body does and does not do. And again, you're, you're not alone in these excuses. The Bible's filled with people who came up with excuses of why what they were doing was okay, even when it's obviously wrong. Another one, when Moses went up to Mount Sinai to receive the law, and he's up there, and Joshua says, there's the sound of war in the camp. And Moses says, that's not the sound of war, that's the sound of a party. They kind of sound the same sometimes. And so they started back down. And Aaron, in his first role as assisting pastor, just blew it. In Exodus 32, verse 2, And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them in the Aaron, and he received the gold from their hand. And listen, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. That's what happened. Now, here's the interesting thing. Moses comes down. He asked Aaron, Aaron, bro, what, what, what are you doing? I love the Bible because it's so honest. And in its honesty, sometimes actually it, there's funny parts in it. Here's what, here's what Aaron said, Exodus 32, 20. So Aaron said, do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. You know the people that they're set on evil. (laughs) So Remember, Aaron was the one going, bring me your gold. I'll make this calf. And then Moses said, what happened? You know these people, Moses. They're bad. I don't say that about y'all. For this, they said to me, make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me. I cast it in the fire, and this calf came out. <laughs> the real version he, he engraved, he tooled, he created And then when he's retelling, we threw gold in, calf came out. Never seen anything like it. And these are the heroes of our faith, gang. Saul. Saul's in an area. He's supposed to wait on Samuel to show up. He doesn't. 1 Samuel 13, 7. As for Saul, he was still in Gagal, and all the people followed him trembling. Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gagal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. A king was not supposed to be a priest and take on the duties of the priest. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering that Samuel came. And Samuel went out to meet him, that he might greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, well, when I saw that the people were scattered from me, there he goes blaming people again. And that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered together mishmash. And I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gagal, and I'm not made supplication to the Lord. Then I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You've not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. 
now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. The Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. We're human. Just like Adam. Just like Aaron. Just like Saul. We want to come up with excuses. But see, when we come up with excuses, the shame and the guilt and the burden of our sin stays on us. And nobody's happier about that than the enemy of your soul. And nobody's more grieved about that than the lover of your soul who said, if you're burdened, come to me. Each one of us has to admit what we've done wrong and ask for forgiveness. Some of you have been carrying stuff for years and it's weighing you down and ripping you off, stealing your joy and your peace. You've held it for too long and it's like a rattlesnake that's hitting you with poison. Put it down. Sit it down and leave it. And pray with me right now, out loud, dear Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died for me so I could be forgiven. And I believe you were raised from the dead so I could have a new life. And I've done wrong things. And I am sorry. Please forgive me of all those things. Please give me your spirit and your power to follow you all my life. In Jesus' name. If you've prayed this prayer with Pastor David, receiving Jesus Christ for the first time, or rededicating your life to the Lord, please call and let us know. We want to send you our exclusive First Steps package for free. This package will help you grow in your new life. Receive your First Steps package by calling 877-458-5508. That's 877-458-5508. Or visit us online at crossthebridge.com. We read about it online, watch it on television, and hear about it on the radio. Our world is filled with violence and fear. Whether it's threats of terrorism around the world or senseless violence in our own backyard, our world is clearly broken and in need of hope. That's why this month only, Cross the Bridge Ministries is offering Know Your Future, Be Immune to Terrorism. This special presentation from David McGee was filmed on the anniversary of 9-11 and is a message of hope and victory. This insightful teaching also exposes the truth about Islam's dangerous past while rejoicing in God's plan for our future. Join David McGee as he helps you and your loved ones to walk in peace and not be afraid of what the future holds. The product Know Your Future, Be Immune to Terrorism is our gift to you for a donation of any amount to Cross the Bridge Ministries. Call today to receive your copy of Know Your Future by dialing 877-458-5508 or visit us online at crossthebridge.com.